Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to John McDonald, CEO of Clear Object, Inc. Magazine's fastest growing IT company in Indiana for the past three years. With that, I'll pass it over to John. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Great to be with you once again for another one of our uh, webinars related to how we approach uh, the problem of the Internet of Things and the opportunities that are driven by it. If you join us for our last presentation, you'll remember that I talked a ton about data and how data was really the driver of the great creator of the next wave of all of business success. And really it's about creating digital products that wrap around the physical products that you have in the marketplace that improve it, uh, augment it, and create streams of information that can be used to understand how those things are being used. So today we're going to dig a little bit deeper into one of the early steps in that process, which is uh, design thinking. And design thinking is really the process of taking what it is that your ideas are and turning them into a specific design. Uh, it's sort of defining your design. And it's very important to get that design right because it's really the touchstone around which the entire rest of the project hangs. Design is actually the intent behind any outcome. Um, it's really how we use that to form a better understanding of the users. Many roads can lead to, uh, to IT projects and IoT projects, but there are certain roads that are better. And using the design thinking principles, what we have is an ability to get an end product that is centered on the users themselves. It's sort of thinking about the problem intentionally in reverse. Uh, oftentimes we look at systems first from the perspective of their functionality. Um, you know, will it in fact do what it is we want it to do as we build it? Will it collect the right data? Will it display what it is that I need? Very functional. But we've all been the victims of, of systems and products that were designed by the very people that code or the engineers that created the solution without a lot of thought to the design. Um, and so design thinking forces us to first and foremost look at how the customer themselves can get a valuable experience, not just a functioning product. It gets something that works for the user, not just a product that simply works. Uh, and the other thing we have to do as a part of this is consider this. Oftentimes, stopping and pausing to think first about good design can be perceived by the people that develop the product as something that slows them down. Why, why do we need to spend all that time and energy trying to figure out what the good design is. But if you don't, again, you'll likely end up with a product that's very functional and completely unusable uh, because it wasn't designed from the perspective of the end users in mind. In fact, what we really need to do is understand that simply identifying what is possible in this solution is not enough. Uh, we have to identify uh, how the user is going to use that solution and start our perspective in that way and what is actually beneficial in that solution, not just what is possible in that solution. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, on, your pic on your screen is a picture. If you're, not, if you're able to see the video display, if you're not, I'll tell you what you're looking at. It's a picture of a fairly conventional coffee maker, um, you know, something going back maybe eight years ago or earlier, uh, all, 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 ever since they started making drip coffee makers for your house. The truth is, this is not an awesome experience, particularly if you're in a house where you're the only one who lives there or you're the only one who drinks coffee. Because this device is designed to create an entire pot full of coffee. Um, and, and that's its only functional outcome. If you try to create just one cup of coffee, you can certainly pour less than a pot full of water in it. Uh, but what you end up with is a pot of coffee that you could cut with a knife. And, and if you brew the entire pot of coffee, as it's designed to do, you're going to end up with seven cups you throw down the drain the next morning before you rinse it out and fill it up with another one. So although it's possible to make coffee with this device, and it certainly is functional in doing so, it's not really an ideal solution. 
Take instead the perspective that the Keurig company did when they designed their coffee maker. Now this is a coffee maker designed from the user experience forward. It says people don't drink coffee seven cups at a time. They drink it one cup at a time. People like to have very fresh ground coffee. And think about some of the coffee makers that you may still have in your home that actually have hoppers where you can pour raw beans in them so that you get that fresh ground uh, taste and smell from your coffee. The Keurig team said that's pretty important from a user experience to have that fresh ground experience. So we got to work that in. People don't always drink coffee. They drink a whole range of hot beverages. In fact, everybody's tastes are slightly different in regards to the hot beverages that they want. So we need a way to make sure that you can use it for different purposes, ranging from soup to tea to hot chocolate to coffee and various flavors of coffee or unflavored, depending on your choice of the day. So what they did was create a device that was designed to address the customer's experience, not just the functional purpose of getting a cup of coffee. And as a result, they've delivered a superior product to the marketplace, a product that, quite frankly, is in many people's homes now because it's so superior. You likely threw out a perfectly good working coffee maker that looked a lot like the perfect picture that I had a few slides ago in favor of the one from Keurig because it was such a superior experience. And I would even add, you probably likely paid much more for that coffee maker from Keurig than you did in the coffee maker that it replaced. You're certainly paying more per ounce for the coffee or the tea that you put through that machine than you did when you were grinding your own beans or buying them in bulk at Target. But you willingly do so because the user experience is so superior to the other way of making coffee. And that just shows you the power in designing first from the client's perspective forward. And if you apply that same idea to almost everything that we do in the Internet of Things and in IT, it's very easy to see that it translates very directly. Uh, the cold hard truth is that we often replace the ultimate user experience as solution providers with just a set of code and software and systems that deliver on the technical uh, requirements of the solution, not centered first on the user design and experience. Uh, those parameters are important, um, but they're far from the only consideration. In fact, they're almost unimportant at the very beginning of the project. What's much more important is centering yourself on the design for the end user. If you begin with the end in mind, as has been frequently quoted, um, your first iteration of the solution is likely to be just as delightful as the last one and it encourages a long-standing engagement that allows you to continually innovate around that over the long haul. What you have to do is strike up a balance between the art of the possible and the technology and resources that make it happen. You have to think creatively from the user's experience perspective and use that as the frame to settle on the necessary features before you can hang the technical details for the project on top of it. The other challenge that we have in the Internet of Things is that there are so many platforms that are available for us today to build to, um, hundreds actually, um, all of which have some pretty rigid technical requirements that they impose upon the user of that platform or the systems integrator that is embedding it inside of a solution. And it's an easy and tempting thing to design the solution for the Internet of Things based on the functionality possible in the platform, and once again, not with the user's ideas in mind. But we have to resist that temptation and understand that every project is different. Even though the platforms are the same, even though they provide the same basic functionality, the end product is always different. Because the heart of the Internet of Things is actually helping customers create digital products around the physical products that they've been offering to the marketplace. Digital products that differentiate the physical product in new ways. The key word being differentiate. 
if everybody's digital product was the same as the next person's, there'd be no differentiation. Uh, if I built a digital product that looks exactly like my competitor's digital product, it would be absolutely useless in differentiating my product from theirs. So it's always different every time. Even though the platforms and the technologies that make the, the solution are often the same, certainly the coding language, often the sensors that are involved, very frequently the cloud infrastructure it runs on is the same, but the end solution not only is always different, it must be different. So where does that differentiation come from if it doesn't necessarily come from the technical underpinnings? And once again, that road leads back to the design. And that's why designing from the user-centric point of view is so critical for all Internet of Things projects. Let me give you a different example. Let's say we had a customer come to us at ClearObject that wanted to design an application for an insurance company, uh, an auto insurance company. Um, certainly, uh, we probably have on our cell phones right now the application for our auto insurance company. So this is not unusual. But most of the times, those insurance company applications are driven from the design points of what the insurance company's own internal IT system is capable of doing, not necessarily what the user experience should be. In other words, they've, they are designed to expose, like an old green screen dumb terminal, the internal inner workings of some IT system back at the home office for the insurance company to allow you the user to service yourself rather than the shame of it having to engage a human being in the process between you and that old system. And that's often because that system, the need to create that system is driven not by your needs as a consumer, but by the company's needs to reduce their cost in servicing you as a customer. So the theory goes, if I create a glitzy little app with bouncing menus and shiny colors, that you'll somehow want to use that more than picking up the telephone and talking to someone who can interface with that system for you. Probably not going to work. Probably not going to result in success, particularly if you start to look at the use cases as to why a consumer or a customer of an insurance company would need to interact with an insurance company. Um, you know, most days, most weeks, most months go by where you never interact with your insurance company. And that's actually better because what's the function of insurance company? Well, it's to insure you against losses when something bad happens. So mercifully, most days go by without something bad enough happening that requires you to interface with your insurance company. So how do you design the solution that in the best possible case and scenario, Nobody ever uses. And when they do use it, it's because something really bad has happened to them. So let's look at this problem from the perspective of the user. What is one of those reasons why you might want to interface with your insurance company? Well, the answer might be you got into a car accident in a busy intersection during rush hour, a terrible thing. And think for a minute about all of the steps that you have to take when that happens in that unfortunate circumstance. Pull over, call 911, get out of the car, look at the damage, make sure the other person's okay, get their information, start taking pictures, writing these things down, sharing your information with the other person, uh, waiting for the insurance company to uh, pick up the telephone when you call them, because you're probably not whipping open the app at this point, because you're probably all uh, upset and anxious maybe cold, maybe it's raining. The last thing you want to do is sit there dinking around with icons and pull-down menus. You want to be talking to somebody. Uh, now you've got to call a tow truck, and so on and so on and so on and so on. What a pain in the butt. If your app for the insurance company was designed simply to interface your finger with a mainframe computer in some far-off city, and not designed to address these things that are happening live when you need the insurance company, you're likely to be spending a ton of money on an app to collect data and information that will never be used by anybody because they're not going to want to open the app if they need to, and they're not going to want to need to open up the app ever. 
So what you have to do is design an experience based first on the user experience and how you engage with that application and understand the state of mind of the user in the moment where they're interfacing with the thing that you're working on. And how do you do that? Well, what you do is try to model the user experience itself by putting yourself in the mind of the user. Those are the opportunities that you have to have that system engage with that user in that state. Then what you have to do is deliver on a range of possibilities. Now that you put yourself in the mindset of the user, what are the imp impossible things that you could never do in your wildest dreams to the immediate low-hanging fruit that you could do this afternoon if you had the ability to just leave the meeting and start? So painting the gamut, if you will, of possible ways that the problem could be solved based on putting yourself in the mind of the actual user itself. Then what you have to do is pick through those possibilities to try to figure out which ones truly enhance the experience for the customer. Um, you could do a lot of things. Which things you should do? And the answer to that question is, which ones are going to make the user experience better? Those are the ones that you should pick out from the list. And what you can then do is put them on a scatter chart that shows a range of high effort to low effort and high impact to low impact of all the possible options that you could select and circle in on the ones that are perhaps low effort and high impact first. So if you can see the visual, the number three possible idea, maybe the number five possible idea, maybe the number two possible idea, and then maybe move up into the high effort and high impact range based on the resources that you have. Then once you pick the solution that you want, perhaps it's number three in this circumstance, you can start to lay out a hypothesis which says, well, what in the world was going on in this person's head that we can change based on getting this particular feature right? In this example is that people don't like filling out the forms and sending all the data in following a car accident. And then you can outline what those pains are. Uh, why is that a problem? Well, they have to go rooting through the glove box to find pieces of information that they hope are still there when they put them in or that it's not still sitting on the file cabinet in their home office. Um, they have to try to keep track of all of this paperwork that's going to different organizations and agencies. They have to make sure that they are filling out the forms properly and filling in all the information, meeting all the requirements to be able to file a claim successfully and not miss anything. Uh, they need to find the best place to do the repairs uh, in, in, a, in, in a world where they hopefully never had to have any repairs. Now suddenly they have to be an expert in it and how to get the right repairs for the right amount of money. So there's an opportunity then that we can see for this particular user to put all that information in one place, make it super easy for them to find. In fact, effortless would be best and analyze the data that's coming back from the user as to what the best choices or options might be for them to repair their car. Of course, some of the things we need to keep in mind as we do that are some of the dependencies and considerations with other people. See how logical that is? You start by putting yourself in the mind of the user, and then you start to fantasize about what the ways that you can do to make the user's life better. You create a persona for the user, and then you start doing mapping of the different solutions based on the ability to achieve them, and then dive deep into them to understand what the best ones are and how to lay out the different intricate dependencies between that user and the other things that they do. You all on this webinar have all just sat through the first exercise in a design thinking workshop. Design thinking is designed to espouse from the people who are present in the workshop all of the ideas floating in their heads from the user perspective first. Often good, by the way, to put users in the room for a design thinking workshop. If you can get the ones who are the victims of the system in the room, they're the best ones to put into the design thinking workshop, but they're not alone. They also have to be the administrators. They have to be the, the people that are supporting the system. 
the leaders of the organization, they're sponsoring the creation of the system. Uh, the people who actually will do the coding and designing of the system so they can listen for nuances and requirements as they start to translate those design points into the technical specifications for the solution. But the idea is to use a series of exercises to pull out of their heads all of the different things that are ways that you can improve the lives of the users of the actual system, user-centric design designing to them first, and then back into the technical specifications from there. Th these can be pretty simple, um, as in an afternoon, but ideally take several days. Um, and there's a wide range of exercises that can be employed situationally, depending on how the conversation is going. If it's necessary to sort of double click or dive deep on something, there are exercises that allow you to sort of figure out the depths and breadths of a problem before you move on to the higher level ideas. And to do that well, uh, not only does it take the time, it often takes a lot of wall space. Uh, the uh, job of design thinking is a very visual and a very interactive experience. Uh, the technology is not that high-minded. You can do most all of it with whiteboards, markers, and sticky notes. Um, but the result is quite high-minded. And, and that is, once again, putting yourself in the user's perspective first and designing backwards from that as you go. And, and what it does is it forces you into looking at the IoT solution from a different perspective, from the reverse angle view. Not from the perspective of the technologist, but from the perspective of the person who's actually going to use the system when it's done. Now design thinking is the predecessor to a whole lot of other work. Work that doesn't go away just because you use design thinking. You still need to design and build code. You still need to integrate in edge technologies and secure devices and sensors. Uh, you still need a cloud platform, uh, a, a good competent one that's fast, capable, and has as much of the framework of IoT solutions that you need already done so that you can deliver the solution more quickly. You still need good project management. You still need good architecture. But all of that is for naught if it doesn't begin first with great design. Uh, because then we end up with a system that was designed by the technical people that built it. And again, like we mentioned at the beginning of the call, we've all been victims of those systems before. And one other note. One of the curiosities about the Internet of Things is that unlike other technical disciplines, it's really about augmenting a physical product that already exists. As I mentioned earlier, the creation of digital products around the physical product. It means, the, therefore, that the driver of these projects is not, are not IT people. They are, in most cases, the visionaries and entrepreneurs and product managers, and in some cases, CEOs of the companies that make those physical products. In most cases, those are not very technical people. And, and if they are technical, their technical skill lies in the underlying product, not the digital product. So if you're building a digital product around a coffee maker, for instance, in our example, we wanted to send data about the performance and the maintenance and reliability of that coffee maker back to Keurig. It's very likely that the people from Keurig are pretty good at thermodynamics, at mechanical engineering, um, even potentially at cooking. And, and, and taste, but not necessarily in building a digital product and running a cloud infrastructure. So if you started with the technical people and said, go ahead and code me a digital service around my coffee maker, well, you're probably not only going to end up with something that nobody really wants to use, it will be not aligned to the underlying product that you're trying to wrap the digital product around. So not only do you have to begin with the user in mind, you actually have to begin with 
the sponsor in mind, which is why it's important to have those people in the room with you, the non-technical sort of product managers and corporate leaders, because their perspective is not only important, it's the whole reason you're probably in the room. So design thinking in a nutshell is quite simply stated as defining your design based on the user's need. It's the intent behind the outcome. You form the intent by understanding the user and the motivations behind what makes the product work for the user by putting yourself in their shoes, as in our example for insurance, and not just seek to turn out something that's functionally capable, but something that's a delightful experience that causes you to brush off the countertop the perfectly functional old coffee maker and replace it with one with a superior user experience, one that your customers will willingly pay more for because it is differentiating from your competition. And in that lies the magic of any solution design, using common components and building custom solutions for each user and for each experience. And that's only done successfully by starting with the end in mind. Thanks for listening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you'd like to continue the discussion about design thinking, please reach out to us at sales at clearobject.com. On behalf of ClearObject, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.